Welcome to Legacy Conversations, a channel where we preserve military memories and history. Hello Internet, we are back and I can tell you I'm excited today because we're talking about something which a lot of you know a lot about and some of you may have heard a lot about it and it's called explosives, demolitions, work like that. And a very specialized subject here because we don't want to talk about normal demolitions. We're going to talk about demolitions where you use behind enemy lines, uh, special forces work, uh, intelligence work, the espionage, spy guys, these things. And we're going to take it back all the way to the Boer Oorlog. That's the Second Anglo Boer War, uh, the one between 1899 and uh, 1902. For most of you who don't know about it, well, let me say the British Army uh, introduced what we call today concentration camps into the world. They rounded up the African women and children on the farms. They basically murdered all the animals. They chased them over the farms. They burnt it down, all these farms. And then they put these people in concentration camps. Yeah, that actual word, concentration camp. Now that's where the Germans got their ideas from when they started murdering the Jews and, and other people in the next war. And you know what? One third, one out of three, of those children and women died in those camps. So there's four of us here today. And I can tell you that uh, one of us, if we were in those camps, would be dead. And I want you to think about this, because there's never been an apology. There's never been anything like that. Uh, there's never been any compensation. There's nothing. It's just something which hangs in the air. And that's why we are a my tribe, He's so angry about it. And that's why I even mention it. But talking about mention, let's start with our our guest here. I will ask him each to introduce themselves. And I've got our Sergeant Major from One Reiki with us, SVF for it. Most of you who haven't read his book yet, please go and read that book. It's a damn good book. Uh, the other guest is Stefano Gia, and they will introduce themselves. But I just want to say he's also writing a book. And by the time we're done with it, it will be a damn good book. And Tian Skitter did actually write the book, which he will talk about himself. Uh, SV, I know, qualified as one of a few people, I think we were two in the country at one stage, as an advanced demolitions fellow, uh, which means they could also disarm bombs, things like that. But SV, and all of you, very welcome here. Thank you for coming. I just want to say before uh, we carry on to SV, I've got a dreadful cold flu flipping thing which got me from behind. I just came out of hospital. I'm definitely going back to bed the moment I'm done here. So if you find me a bit more dumb looking like normal, then I probably am. So Esmir, thank you for being here, all of you. You can start now. Tell us, Esmir, what's going on here? Where, where does, uh, what are we talking about and, and how are we going to do this? Uh, morning, Kus, Kian, and Steph. Thank you for this opportunity and thank you for that introduction because you actually took the words out of my mouth. Um, just before I'm going to uh, emphasize the, the purpose of this meeting, my daughter had a Afrikaans speech in grade seven last year uh, and I had selected a very sensitive topic, concentration camps. And I got a book from Dr. Jackie Grobler and it was... Uh, Frau Comprinol. It was all small uh, notes and so forth that the women in 50 concentration camps wrote, and he combined it. And one of his sources is Emily Hoppers. And if you read that book, it's horrific what they did to our women and children. And and the stats, the I think it was about 500,000 British soldiers fighting against. 600 Boers, not soldiers, 600 Boers, not guys that trained to fight, but we had a world to fight. And, and interesting, it was the first time in a very, very long time that the British Army were losing. They were losing the battle. And it was train loads and train loads of uh, trucks that were sent back to England for, uh, that the Boers killed. And the only way they could start winning the war was killing our women and children. And statistics showed that 50% of the total Boer uh, children population was killed in concentration camps. 
But what is unique, unique about it is that out of the ashes, out of the dust, out of farms being burned down, the Afrikaner folk stand up again to a brilliant uh, nation that's unique in the world. The purpose of this meeting is, I actually always tell Kuz, I want to start at, we've talked a lot about our days in the war in Gala, Mozambique, and Lesotho, and all that places, but we never talked about the Boer Wars. And this is like the first time we're going to touch that. Um, specifically, Tian is the expert in that. And and he actually found me and he said, that operation where you, which you guys did in the northern uh, province of Angola, um, where you ambush trains and you blow up bridges, there's a lot of, uh, uh, how are you going to say, with the incomes. Uh, between that and what we are doing, what we did. Uh, and a matter of fact, we weren't that unique. The Boers in about 100 years back did exactly the same, and they improvised everything. Tian will go in more into that. And so we will start off with um, the other two guys quickly introduce themselves, and then me and Tian will start about a correlation. So uh, I think, Steph, if you can start introduce yourself. Uh, good day, all viewers, and uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, Esvia and Tian for the opportunity. Uh, I must just say, I'm not such a boffin on all these subjects, but we, we did a lot to make a difference. So, yes, um, all I can just say is an introduction to how all this started um, with the, the border war. And obviously, in 1966, Swapu infiltrated Wamberland and they tried to overthrow the SA interim government, as we know. And uh, in uh, 1975, after the Angolan coup, Swapu started planting mines in Wamberland, um, which was on the Angolan border. And this was a vast uh, border area, approximately thousands of kilometers. It had to be covered by the South African army and especially the engineers. So, but in, I must come back now. It all started um, in, in between this in 1971. There was a, a guy with by the name of Vernon Joint. And uh, Vernon Joint was just a normal pharmacist. And he got bored of counting uh, tablets and poles and uh, all that. And he, he studied further in applied chemistry. And we, he obtained a doctorate and he got involved in mine protected vehicles and systems. Uh, right, they, this was approximately 1971. And I think Esther can agree with me, we've seen a lot of these, they look like hoha spiders that were covering the roads to, to try and detect mines and explosives and all that. And in the end, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, joined developed the Casper and like specifically for the police. And I think the Casper, the derivative of Casper, has got police involvement in the name. So later on, uh, the army got the Buffalo and then the Mamba and other uh, mine protected vehicles. So I think the doc achieved his goal there eh? and he got probably got bored again and uh, he tried to to sort of counter his development and he looked at how his techniques can be used into um, what we call clandestine demolitions which is more sabotage type of explosives so the, the doc was very effective in that. And um, 
he started training uh, the special forces, um, guys like Esfia and others, and uh, also uh, got involved with him in 1984 when uh, we, we started training the UNITA forces uh, in these techniques. Uh, now, just to explain to you, um, these techniques were mostly offensive, which is, if I can read you an, uh, a definition of the IED, IED stands for Improvised Explosive Device. And it is a bomb designed uh, to destroy or damage the personnel or any property. And it, it's used on the target or, or to distract or disrupt or delay the enemy. So, so there's many ways, but you can also use um, IEDs or clandestine explosives um, to defend yourself. Uh, you know, like um, Claymore mines and uh, where you, what we call the prof other, where you breach a minefield, which the enemy plant, uh, planted, and you breach that minefield by using your own explosives. So there's many techniques, but um, yeah, uh, just to, I, I'm not a, uh, um, expert, but a bomb is, we all know a bomb, uh, but it consists of explosives, a detonator, and then the initiator, which sets for a trigger mechanism that uh, initiates the, the explosives. So uh, I want to come back again to who actually taught us all these techniques. Uh, Dr. Vernon Joint was initially at uh, the CSIR in Pretoria, um, and he, he started too many funny things there. So they decided, no, they must move him because he was blowing up explosives on the N4 and the N1 on the and he had a small piece of property there. And they said, no, no, you can't <laughs> do your bombs here right next to the highway. So they took him a bit further north from Victoria, and he started off there. Um, and also he started a company, Mechem, uh, Mechanical and Chemistry Industries or whatever. So, uh, Mekim was consisted of Dr. Vernon Joint, and he also had a um, great old, he looked like Christmas father, Theo van Dijk, bald headed with a beard, and uh, Hans Heemann. I think Hans Heemann was involved with Colonel Breitmark. He was a company commander during... Um, uh, the ops at the singer. So yes, uh, they came come a long way, and then also, as I said, explosives. That was Doc Joint's uh, department, and then for the the initiators or the mechanisms, there was a company called EMLC. And they stood for electronic, magnetic, logistical components, something like that. And that company was headed by Colonel Sabi from the Spain. And he also had a, a lot of Teva engineers. Uh, their base was, um, they were based right at, uh, the Special Forces HQ, and uh, we worked a lot with both of these companies. So, yes, I think 
I'm, I'm just going to explain briefly the three components and how we use them together to sort of uh, do our clandestine uh, demolitions, uh, especially with the UNITA guys. Now, the explosives, uh, we mainly use P4 plastic explosive or whatever, uh, which is basically the same explosive as you would get in artillery or mortar bombs and aircraft bombs, etc. Also, anti tank mines. But then we, we also use um, sheet explosive, which looks like a, a small, thin sheet of explosive, which you can cut. And I think they even had a leather pattern. You, you can brush it with some nugget, and it looks like a nice leather belt, and you can make a nice leather jacket. And that is why the word clandestine explosive actually came from. Uh, we also have the cortex, which is a, a detonating port, uh, which is also used as an initiator. So there's, I'm not going to, to go into detail, but uh, there's many uses for it. Uh, it depends on your type of target. The next type of explosive we used was the fuel, a liquid explosive. And I'm not going to tell you what it was, but it, it was very effective. And uh, uh, it's just a liquid, and we, we mixed it with a, a sort of a boosting agent normally, and if I can just come back briefly, there was a, also an explosive, but it was a boosting explosive. It, it was called the pentalite booster. It, it looked like a kind of a wine cork with a hole through, which you can put your detonating cork through. And that boost, uh, we also used that for our uh, to breach minefields, etc. So, if you mix the the pentalite with the liquid explosives, it it will give you the color of uh, a rosé wine. If you mix more, it will be a more red wine. So, you you can make your own um, mixture there. Then you just have to use uh, a, a detonator to initiate that. Um, so, yes, that we use that very effectively um, against um, the Cubans in the Wambu area. The Unitas came to us, and um, there was a, a quite a big, I would say. 20, 30,000 of Cubans in the Wambo VA area during 1985. And uh, uh, UNITA decided that they will target these areas. Um, the Cubans like, uh, they like the rum and they like women and uh, they, they didn't like when the Angolans sit with them in the bar. So they would, we would go there, get the bottles of, of the rum from them by informants, and we'll get empty bottles and then mix it according to the color and send it back to them. So we, I think we, we had quite, uh, some huge successes. I personally uh, know that over weekends, at least 20 plus uh, Cubans just died in those bars. And uh, the nice thing was they, they didn't know what, you know, basically no 
all little Angolan um, fatalities. So it was quite a good success. And later on, uh, they they got a bit scared because they didn't know which bar to visit uh, and which one will be next to be bombed. And uh, they kept into their hostel. They had a, a huge hostel in the center of Wamba. I think it was a, a four-story. And we got a uh, was a jeep. It's these Russian jeeps. We got it from there. I think it was paid by the Nika uh, agents, brought to us, and we fixed it with explosives on the sides, inside the doors, um, the fuel tank, even the, the, the tires were pumped with liquid. I, I reckon there was about 350 kilogram of explosives in there. And after two two days, they parked it right back there, and the guy who parked it just walked off, and he said, "Okay, cheers, you guys." <laughs> and about twenty minutes later, uh, there was no bowling. So uh, that that was a huge knock for the Cubans, and they they just said, "No, we had enough." We want to fly back to Angola. So, yes, that's that was another um, bomb where we used the lady with a, a book bomb and some of the sheet explosives inside the book bomb. Uh, but I forgot to come, uh, if I can come back to uh, EMLC, they, they, um, manufactured all these different devices for triggering mechanisms. It, it could be a, a pull or a pressure mechanism or even an anti-light just to as with a little L, look like a LED light and you can even have an anti-detection um, device. It's got a round magnet. So whenever you try to detect, it will explode or trigger. So there was many. Um, you can also use all these in a combination. There was some self-destruction devices or remote. But anyhow, to come back, the story, um, yes, it was very effective, and um, we we achieved our goal during that year. But then, obviously, in, in 1986, uh, the threat came back again. I think old Fido, Fido told um, all the Cubans, no, guys, uh, you, you are just scared for nothing. Go back to Angola, go teach those boys um, um, some more things. But yes, um, we had a good successes. I must just say one thing, and uh, as we had touched on that improvised, uh, you, you must be able to, to really, if there is a threat, Look at it at the situation where you are in, and uh, then you have to to see uh, how you can overcome that. But anyhow, uh, just one example I want to make is um, the Unitas came to us and Doc Joint was sitting there, and they said, um, you know, Doc. When we plant the mines or the blow up the railway lines, um, before we get there, we have to breach a mine field, which is laid along the railway line. Then to get there, sometimes 
they detect this, these mines. So that's where we use um, the liquid explosives. And we had a, a powder, which uh, the doc called it M4. M4, I don't know, it's probably a scientific, scientific name, but it looked like the powder. If you mix that with the liquid, it becomes a slurry. And then you just throw that slurry into the gravel where the um, railway line is. Obviously at a strategic place. And then you will put your detonator and your, um, your trigger mechanism. And then they understood that very well. But then at one stage, they said, but the, the, the guys are coming um, before the trains and they detect these mechanisms. So the doc uh, joined. He asked me, he said, Steph, you have a compass here? I said, yes, uh, doc, but these company, compass, they are issued to me, so I must give them to the leaders of these things. He said, no, no. He took the compass and he drilled two holes uh, across. And he connected two copper wires on that. And then he would have that um, diagonally across the railway. So these, the, the needle will point north and south like the railway. And then when the train comes, the, remember the train has got more um, iron and then it will switch automatically and that will detonate. So uh, I, I must tell you that <laughs> I don't think anyone will just think about that at the spur of the moment and it worked brilliantly. So obviously all my leaders left without compass and compasses and uh, we had to order hundreds of solar camp compasses just to make these mechanisms. But yes, that is just, um, I'm going to leave it over. And uh, I think, Tian, it will be very interesting to hear your story about how the Boers uh, did their thing. Thanks, Steph. That's very interesting. Uh, just, just to give the listeners a little bit of a background about explosives. Uh, the one benefit of explosive is if you mess, mess it up, you wouldn't know you're dead. It is not like a second chance if you mess around with explosives. And it always follows the least line of resistance. So if you put a, a like PE4 explosive against the dam wall, 90% of the effectiveness of that charge will go away from the wall. And out of that, they develop us... Um, charges like the beehive where you put a beehive and it will shoot a hole in the dam wall about a meter meter and a half deep and then you can put explosive inside there and that is much much more effective to counter uh, the the least line of resistance you can tamp it with sandbags uh, for instance where we blew up a, a pillars of a bridge then we put the charges under the water. I can't remember the depth, meter, meter and a half. And you can lessen the weight or the size of your explosive with 60%. And what we found out later, it is not the explosive that disrupt the bridge. It's the water spout. And we saw, unfortunately, yeah, I have a fight to somewhere. The water spout actually went up and it took the span of the bridge and completely destroy that. So th th there's a lot of ways that you can channel the energy of the explosives. Um, courses that you can do in the army, and it probably not to everybody, it's more the engineers and the guys of 3-2, like Steph, and, and then our guys, is you do a basic, intermediate, and advanced. Advanced, you go to front start and you do it there. Uh, that was the longest exam I ever wrote, for six hours. You have to have uh, 80%. Uh, and then further on, you can do, uh, do uh, IED, OED, 
that's a uh, ID like Steph explained, improvised explosive devices, and the other is just ordinance explosive, just like a landmine, uh, claymores, if you blow that up. ID is that you have to disassemble that charge. Now, IEDs started, I don't think it started there, but we our instructors came from England. Uh, the IED there specifically, they would put up a small chart and they will get the IED operator with the second chart. So they 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 didn't go for the population like they did in South Africa, the INC. They would get the IED operator closer to the second chart. And that way they killed the IED operators. Um, and then the last one we did was the clan, clandestine explosive. That was with Dr. Vernon Joint. That's extremely uh, interesting. What we teach us, and what we had to teach the UNITAS again, uh, is we had explosive that looks like butter. So they would um, take it into the camp, because they always get searched. If they come with their bicycles, they get searched. So the explosive was in the frame. So eventually they get it out of there, and they would took this butter, put it on the tables where the Cubans were eating with a very short delay fuse. And then, yeah, they got more than just butter. <laughs> that was one way. The poor Cubans, <laughs> they were they were the target of all these improvised explosives. Uh, like Steve said, uh, uh, EMRC was the guys that built us the James Bond devices. Uh, I met a guy, I'm not going to mention his name, uh, Tia Naomi, also very well. He showed me the book 40 years back. We started with these things, pencil sketches, and he said, out of this, they built something, and then we'd give it to us. We will test it, come back. For instance, we would say, okay, now the limpet mines, it's all very, very potent, but when you put it on the tank, when the magnets hit the tank, it sounds like a pistol shot. Now you try to be quiet, and then they improvised that again. So they were forever uh, improvising, uh, for interest's sake, uh, this guy that I'm talking about from EMLC, he manufactured the beta light. I think most of you out there know the beta light. And he said there was only three countries in the world that could do that. And he showed me one, 45, 50 years old, open it, it's still working. So we had brilliant guys that uh, supported us with what we need, improvised explosive devices, and, and, and there was something else I would like to, before we go over to Tian. Uh, yeah, the liquid explosive we used is the slurry, uh, where they had the trucks, uh, or the uh, two trucks before the locomotive. No, no the, the, the device they improvised for us from the MLCS side. Uh, you can't sweep it. If you sweep it, it detects that energy field from your mind detector. Enhance it, put off the charge. You can't open it. It's got a, 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 a device that pick up the disturbance. So if, for instance, you put your device at the angle of 40 uh, degrees, it will wake up, it will register 40 degrees, and that will be its arm position. So it was a, a brilliant mechanism. There was nothing they could do to take it out of the ground and see what the hell are the we're a building here that we can't disrupt, but it's that's disrupting our trains. Uh, yeah, that's about it. And I think that will go over to Tian, the correlation between what we did and what the Boers did about 100 years before us with not all these fancy uh, equipment and uh, the professors and the doctors and the chemicals. They didn't have that. But they, they I would say, were uh, the leaders in reconnaissance, the leaders in guerrilla warfare, the leaders in sabotaging. So, yeah, it's a pity we can't get one of them alive anymore. Tian? Thanks, Israel. Uh, first, thank you for the opportunity and Steph for your interesting stories. Um, as Israel said, uh, I have to go 100 years back to, to, to show you what the Boers did in, in those days with the, with, the, with the British. And as I said, um, with the, the, when the British um, took over South Africa, they, they, everything was uh, due to mobility. 
if they haven't that, because they had only had ox wagons in those days to, to transport all their all their uh, all their uh, um, uh, provision. So what happened in um, when they took over the all the all the rail, rail, railways, they had to still had to need they still need a, a coal, and that they got from East East London. Interesting enough. And with all that that huge force that they had, so they had to, to use use it for all their um, equipment and cannons and whatever to to get it up north. Up north is now from the Free State, the Northern Cape, and and even uh, not 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 at all. So um, what happened in the the Boers uh, after they lost the initial part of the of the of the con conventional war. They had to with, withdraw back to the to the Orange Free State and to, to the Transvaal. But uh, just one thing back um, uh, in those days, the, the, we know the cause of the war was due to, 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 the, to the gold that they had discovered in, in Johannesburg. But but um, there was a, um, uh, a company, the South African Fabrieken for ontplofbare stoffen beperkt at Modder Fontaine. Um, that was built in the back in the 1880s, and they manufactured dynamite there specifically for for the for the for the mines. And um, what's interesting enough that uh, uh, when the outbreak of the war, uh, they had 312,000 uh, cases of dynamite. So it's a lot of dynamite all around. And they even used it here in Falcons Rest and and in and in Bobberton. Now, what's interesting, each dynamite cartridge uh, was wrapped in a brown paraffin paper and, it, and it weighed about 51 pounds, which is equal to 2.268 kilo, kilo, kilogram. And you will hear later that um, Jack Hinden said they used about 50 sticks, which amounts to 113 kilograms of dynamite, which they used per, per mine. Now, if you, um, just to show you something interesting on, on this photograph here, and Esvia, I want you to, 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 to help me here. As you can see, uh, with, with, during the, with, the with, 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 withdrawal of the Boers, they had to uh, um, bow up all these bridges from in the Free State, the Transvaal, from the Eastern Transvaal. Uh, this is now from Forksrest to Joburg and so forth. And that's quite, quite interesting. They used a lot of uh, overseas people which worked on the mines. And the, even the, and in this case, the, the Dutch. They were really um, uh, uh, they worked on the and they even like con constructed all these bridges and and railway lines and now they asked these guys to to blow up these these bridges and as as you you can see there that there's a there's a uh, there's a train wagon there on the bridge there are some uh, boers there and what they uh, this shows you that they, they took these cases of dynamite and then they placed it on these pillars. And you can see they've already blown those 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 parts there, and um, uh, and how much dynamite is actually needed to 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 to, to do this damage. Um, so it was quite heavy, because and then I I, I think in this case Esvia, I think they they, they put it uh, uh, just under the the bridge there onto that pillar, and um, this is actually one of the the only photographs. Uh, I have is shown at the same bridge at Fit, at Fit River, where where they blow where where they blew up uh, uh, that specific bridge. Now the aftermath is 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 this, and there there you you you, you can see how um what the what what the what the damage was. So that top part, there's a guy sitting there, and you can see the in the the, the aftermath. It's just a massive must have been a massive e e explosion. So um. How much dynamite is needed? I can't. I can't tell. Uh, we can do calculations, Israel. I don't know, but it it might might be possible. Now, looking <clears throat> at the railways, the, 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 they call it the Netherlands with Afrikaans as Spoorweg Mat Matskapai. That that had these uh, locomotives, and the British were off after these lo lo locomotives um, to to transport all their goods, and the the main locomotive used used on South African railways was this 40 tonner. And it's interesting enough that all that at, at specific numbers and um, you could uh, see which, which one traveled where because the British when they later on uh, described all these train wrecking, they uh, even mentioned that the locomotive number. 
This is a larger one. It's a 46 standard, but um, the, uh, there weren't many of them. And um, but the main ones were were were, were those lo locomotives. Now, but the Boers, um, when they saw now they can after the the the, the Dorenhoek, this is the east of Pretoria on the on the N4, when they lost that part of the conventional war, and uh, and then where they were dropped back to Mas yeah, at Belfast with Bergendal. Uh, Battle took place, the last conventional battle. Louis Boeta said, Listen, chaps, we must do something because they're using our railways and um, uh, to, to stop them. And from that, they went to here to Komati Port because there were over 2,000 uh, uh, trucks and locomotives parked there. And um, if the Boers uh, uh, were clever enough, they should have blown up these Tantrat, uh, uh, these. these uh, 19 tonner uh, locomotives. They, they, there were only four of them. And they operated here at the tunnel at, at uh, Waterfall Boerpe. And they were also also, also taken back to, uh, back to, uh, to Kumati Poort. If they blew up those, then all those trains wouldn't have, wouldn't have been available to the, to, to, to the British Army. So, um, so then Louis Botha said, listen, we have to do something. Um, and when they, then uh, he formed a certain uh, uh, corpses. There was one, um, uh, the, 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 um, the uh, Karl Krigart, he was a captain, and he had uh, some certain guys and um, a couple of guys with him. And then Jack, Jack Hinden and Henry Slachtkamp, they, uh, I'll show you a picture of them now. They, they formed in their, 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 their own corps, the Hinden corps, as, as they were known. That is Jack Hinden there, Henry Slachtkamp. He was a Dutchman, and his adjutant was that Demer guy. But uh, you, later on, I'll tell you that only oh, no, by these four four guys that, that that operated with the with the, with the dynamite. The Boers were scared using it. I don't know why, but um, but but the, the, these five guys they they were the uh, in the Hinden corps. They were the guys who worked handled the, the dynamite. Jack Hinden himself didn't. And all done, 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 done. Now, uh, you can see uh, I've got these two names, uh, Cole Kramer and Max Buster. Interesting enough, these two guys uh, were from the Bocciabello um, uh, missionary uh, camp, or, or um, uh, it's not, not a town, it's uh, another setting there, north of, of Middleburg. And these guys, um, you will see, there were 110 uh, 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 burgers, as they called them, Boers, uh, in, uh, that formed part of this commander. Now, these two were Germans, and Karl Kramer came up with the, the, the idea, which is the first IED ever, ever used. And there it, and there, and there, and there, and there it is. The top picture was drawn by Jack Hinden in his book. Um, I've got the original copy in front of me. And then, um, as you can see here, what they, what they, what, what they actually, what they, what they did is to take a, um, uh, uh, Martini Henry, and it's interesting enough. It was a quite a large bullet, as 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 as, as you, you you can see here. Yeah? This is get uh, lots of them at the, on the battlefields here in, in South Africa. So th this is a monster, right? Look at that! Look at that bullet. The part in this is this one. We, this is the, the the bullet itself. So I to to take that off. And then, in, funny enough, on the, on, the, on the inside there was a paper, and they took that out, and then, and then the um, the what we call it the uh, the drive model. It just it, it was uh, it was funny looking. This out, this I took this out out of one 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 of, of these cartridges. So um, this is is what they what what they used. That that is the Mark Martin Henry. Um, they. And so I saw off the butt, the barrel, and the bill that that uh, that uh, that what do you call it um, the um, the what protected that uh, the the trigger the trigger pr pr protector, and then they mounted this um, this part of the of the gun that Martin Henry between two um, two uh, uh, in the wooden box, and because it mustn't fall fall over. And then uh, from that, they, they took what they call, what, what um, old uh, in, uh, uh, Jack Hinden said, in, in that, in that um, satchel there. 
and then it was connected one of other, one of other way with 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 uh, with uh, with a uh, uh, fuse. Uh, this is a, is a, is another um, uh, picture of that of that in, in, in device. And as you can see there at the bottom, there is the um, the bucket with fifty um, candles of of dynamite. So um, what they did, they 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 uh, they took out the um, the ballast from the from 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 beneath the, the railway track, and then they um, mounted the the trigger mechanism there, and then they um, uh, had to had to uh, hide it very very well, because they uh, when the first bomb was exposed was exploded, they uh, was on the sixth of September nineteen hundred. When they experimented with the first one, that was if you travel from the from the uh, on the N4 between uh, uh, Bronkostrait and and Wit, Witbank, just beyond it, that that score uh, factory there, that they, on, on that view was was this first mine ever tested of coal of coal coal Kramer, and it worked very very well, and from then on onwards they um, they went they went they uh, they go for it. And in my book, they'll say there are 75 pages of each and every in, in incident on the on the railways in South Africa. Even if they um, they uh, uh, took the fish plates from the from the tracks, and uh, even took the uh, they um, blown some of them up. But that didn't. They they wanted to catch trains. The reason for that is they want they want ammunition and clothing and even food there was a huge shortage of 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 that later on now um <clears throat> now what happened on um uh, on that day uh <laughs> quite interesting enough there was the the commander at Dalmoral was a, a, a commander uh, backhouse and in his diary he wrote this <laughs> it's quite funny uh the when the, the they, they heard the explosion around about 8, 8, 8, 8 p.m. And then a uh, then rescuing party was sent from Bruxbrook, which was closer to Witbank, who were given some whiskey by the men on, on the train. I didn't know that a bomb scope or what was anymore. <laughs> but the, as a consequence, five men of the battalion were found drunk. <laughs> Tried by court martial and given a year's in, in, imprisonment. So uh, I don't know if uh, the, the drunk like me can come by on the help as a bomb bomb stock card. So um, so the boys went on and on, and then they they started they have to look for 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 these bombs. And this is an interesting picture. They even use gangers, plug plug bosses, as they say in Afrikaans. And this poor guy, he detonated one of these mines um, close to Middle Middleburg at Apex Stars. If you if uh, if you have a, if you stand there by the ultra city, you have a look towards uh, Middleburg. It, it's on that ridge there. And this poor guy, his name was uh, this this Nelson guy. He in 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 his whole team because he had four blacks with him and his dog um, on that on that trailer, and they they were blown up there. And it shows you that even that um, how light. Uh, it wasn't a heavy um, uh, a trolley that, but it shows you how, how sensitive the trigger mechanism was. So, um, so what that, that the British also did, they sent out scouts, just as SV said in, in these days, to look for any uh, uh, disturbance around these these ballast here, and. Um, and then they someday they picked, they picked these, these mines up and they, they saw something and they, with their own re, re, reconnaissance, uh, Hinden and Slavka mentioned that they saw that they when they uh, um, uh, um, went to uh, plant these mines, they, they usually did it early in the morning, uh, early in the, in, the, in, the, in the afternoon, just before last light. And then, and that's when they, when they saw these their tracks in the in the in the dew, so they have to change their um, uh, manner of planting these uh, uh, devices. And the, as an SVS case, you have to when they when they plant this bomb, you have to, to re, re, remove a, a quite a huge amount of ballast because they needed the, the the weight of the of that train to 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 set off the the trigger. And to, to, to detonate these these mines, 
Now, what, um, just to show you what the what the how, how one of these trains look or or local uh, local uh, local locomotives, you can see it with what the explosion was right in the front of that of the train. And this is another one. Um, this, this was a bigger train, and you can see the whole front part was actually blown, blown, blown off by by these mines. But the, but the later on, the, the British um, they also made not other plans. They sent empty trains uh, or trains with with no with no um, uh, forward and stuff in, in front of that, and then they uh, sent the actual train also with 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 uh, trucks before the in or in, in front of the of the uh, lo locomotive and here, and here you can see see some 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 british troops the locomotive there and this is a truck here now what that Karl Trichard and his and his gang what what they actually did in, in the earlier parts they cut off the the vacuum pipes at the back of the, of these of these trains so the old old train came to a standstill and they and then they could they could rob rob them and um so in this case you can see there's a machine gun right in front here on the on on this truck and if there's any attack they, then they they can they can uh, defend themselves and you'll see on this this train number this 211 his name was america and voila that photograph was taken at frederickstadt which is just north of Poch. And here you can see that same lo lo locomotive it had some damage there and some train trucks lying there. So um, he also met his final de uh, destiny. Now, looking at the, 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 the other armored trains that, that the British used uh, with, with, with these ones, that even cannons on them, and uh, they used them effectively later, later on. And the Boers were actually shit, shit scared of these, um, um, of these armored trains. Because they could uh, detach or hook off some of these uh, ones with with the with the guns and then send the other one forward, looking for the tracks and the boers as they they, they crossed the, the railway lines. And then the last one last thing, um, and in my in my, in my book, this this is the an, another um, <laughs> method of uh, blowing up trains because they haven't had um, remote con 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 controls. They had to, um, and the British, because they sent empty trains in front of the actual train with the with with the supplies, they improvised by planting the mine under the railway track, and with a piece of wire, which they called the draw trackers, they <laughs> they could pick the actual train and detonate the, these mines under the lo uh, uh, lo 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 locomotive, and this is how they managed to blow. Hundreds of trains, hundreds of them. And if you'll see in my in my book, it's it is listed there, each and every incident. Quite interesting enough, the first shots that were fired in the Boer War was a Krypon on a train. The first uh, or, or, or artillery round that was fired was also there. And the last one was fired at Utip up, up in the Northern Cape when the Boer sent an uh, and a small lo lo locomotive loaded with, with dynamite into, into the into the British post there, but uh, they like luckily for them they they they, they stopped that that uh, uh, locomotive. But this is in short the history what the what the what the Boers did to to the to the to the, to the, to the British. Tian, yes, yeah, that was very interesting. You mentioned something about anchor notes. Uh, tell us tell us about that. Um, Yes, yes, it's quite interesting. Um, uh, I would like to to take you or, or the legacy team to 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 the spot. It's just north of Pretoria on the Hamans Coral Road. Um, in this last comp, uh, what happened uh, a couple of weeks before that day, they they was attacked a train close to Nobum Strait. And that is the actual spot, the graves of the eight Boers that uh, died there on that attack, uh, included all. Paul Kramer, the the father of the of of the the, the I, 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 e, D. and um, then they came back. They were the the, the they they weren't very um, the uh, moral was very low at that stage. So then they said, "Listen, we 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 we're going to try something else." 
And then uh, because they, had, they haven't had water there, and that, because the Springbok flock there, no, it's, it's a, in, in winter time, there's no water there, and they, they really struggle. They, in, in, in the, uh, Slagkamp even mentioned that they used urine to 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 to, uh, to sterilize the wounds. And, um, and quite interesting enough, I didn't realize that I asked the medical doctor that that urine is actually a, a, a good sterilizing product. I don't know if you guys ever used urine <laughs> to, to to sterilize wounds. Um, but then they attacked this this um, train, this north of Pretoria on the Amman Scroll Road at um, Plaas Grootvlei, and they, then it was in a cutting. And this was interesting uh, the, that that morning the train train came from Pretoria with a, 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 a Colonel van der Leer of the British, and he had a nice booze up the, the previous night. And then um, they attacked that that train early. It was about seven o'clock in the morning. I, I, if I remember, we also had a black guy walking in front, looking at the tracks, see if they see anything funny. And then came the the uh, the, the train uh, with the empty, or, uh, as you're showing, with a with a machine gun on in, in the front uh, a truck. And then um, Henry Schlacht, and because they the, these wires, they have to, to be very close to the to the actual point of, of the when when they do when they set it off. So the poor guys, I don't know how they managed with all with these explosives close, close to them, how the how the ears uh, ma managed that. <laughs> but what he saw um, as the train came, he blew it up, and then they the British took cover in this in this truck. Um and they struggled to, to, to get all of them. And what they did, they took tins and in that also dynamite with nails and rocks and stuff which they put into into that and they liked that i think the, the fuse mother must have been very short because um the slack comes and uh, described that he threw it into that into that first um truck which i struggled with where, where the british were hiding and just one of those hand grenades helped to help them to uh, to actually uh, uh, sur surrender so um that just was quite interesting the only account which i know of where where, where they uh, described and, and grenades in the world war. You know, I have to say I'm finding this extremely fascinating because it seems to me that uh, there are certain things which we we can learn from here and there are certain things we could have improved. I, will, I, want, I have a question to Steph now, dear, and there's where for it. You will recall that Dr. Stion, we forgot to say, but he's a PhD in science, you know, it's like quite a clever man. But you remember that first picture you showed of us where the birds were blowing up a train bridge and you saw the half of the bridge was already lying down. Yes, he's showing it for us there. Now, my question to you, Stefan, is that if the birds had somehow got hold of sandbags or stones or something and packed it over those cases of dynamite or wind, would that have made a difference? Yes, Chris, yeah, interesting. Uh, something I forgot, Steph, touch, Steph touched on that about seed explosive uh, is used for cutting. Now, we had uh, what they build as linear charges. I can't remember the amount of explosive, maybe less than a kilogram. And if you, uh, on the cover of my book, uh, you would see I'm sitting in front of a, a, a steel plate. I cut my initials onto that plate. Now, you only used about half a kilogram to cut a railway line. So they didn't have that benefit of, of uh, I expl sheet explosive. The detonation speed is much higher than, for instance, our uh, TNT or PETN. Uh, but of course, if you say they tamper it, they put the sandbags on top, they should have, they, the problem number one is then the pommies would have picked, picked it up. And they had scouts in front. They used the blacks, if it's correct, yeah, to walk in front. So it's very difficult. Uh, if you take the rocks away on top, you have to put it next to the railway line. The top part was the dust or the oil. You must put that aside because that must come back. Because they also, in Angola, they walk the same guys in front to look specifically for that. And when we arrive at the railway line, I told the guys, guys, don't sit on the railway line, the UNITA guys. Uh, go and sit away, don't even come close to the railway line because they just pick up one track 
And if they suspect that you have something there, and build a fire on top of it. But yeah, to, uh, to tamper it with sandbags, of course, number one, it's very difficult to camouflage it. Um, number two, they want the, the, the better part of the explosive to go up against the train. So they will have to put it on the sides of, of it. And then again, it's it's solid. The ground is solid, uh, hardened like a rock, because we can have very difficult. Or otherwise, you have to carry the sandbags from quite a distance. And um, they already had a problem if they walk in the dew. They leave a uh, uh, Afrikaans a lachspur. You can easily see where a guy walked between long, tall grass. You can see. It. So yeah, I think logistically it it. it didn't, it's not going to work. I don't know if Steph want to add something there. Yes, dear, yes I, I agree with you. And uh, just to come back to the railway lines, that that's the reason why the slurry we used with the liquid explosives and, and the powder, if you mix it, it goes, it penetrates much further than any other uh, explosive available at that stage so it was very uh, effective and it would also camouflage well so you you would just scrape off the first few layers of, of gravel throw in your slurry a few kgs or liters and it cement and then, then you're ready to go. Uh, I found an article. Um, one of these graphs came from that article in the South African Military History uh, 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 Society. Back in, it was on 25th of July, 20, no, 2009. Sorry. The friends of the rail, of the rail site at Capital Park, they actually tested uh, the, 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 this Boer mine. <laughs> they, they use a 73 ton locomotive and every time when they when they position the, this um, this uh, firing the device under the, the rail track it detonated it uh, it uh, was it was set off so it just shows you this IED that the Boers uh, developed in those days uh, was effective but um but still there's dynamite dopies um or was it the slag slag dopies of the of the three hundred three or the um, the um, Lee Metcalf? And uh, you can see I've got a I've got a, 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 a one which we see discovered on a uh, on a um, battlefield here at, at Belfast, and there was a that a, 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 a slag camp said that you take this and there is a, a, a stick piece of paper. Which was uh, uh, between the 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 core cordite and the and the point, and this is the actual point, one that was fired, which you found there at, Car at Carolina, and uh, so just just to to to, to show um, what at what links they, uh, they had to go through to make sure that the that the the the, 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 uh, the um, gunpowder was enough to to, to detonate. These, these, these mines. Chris and, and, and Tian and Steph, I just want to, and that's how me and Tian started to talk. Uh, the, uh, it's so it's so unique to see the correlation between what they've done 100 years back. Uh, untrained, not soldiers. 100 years later, we got more than a year's training, and then after that, you specialize into small teams, explosives, and, and, and everything we did in the in the uh, Anglo Angola war, they did as well. They did reconnaissance, they did anti-tracking, they lift from the from the bush, they they, they did demolitions, they did improvised demolitions. So they were not even our forefathers, they were the forefathers of uh, uh, reconnaissance. One reconnaissance, two five reconnaissance, three two battalion. So with much more, uh, for Dina Medallia, for what they did with little support, no backup, no tools, no fancy equipment, no uh, Vernon Joins MLCs to support them. They build it themselves. And I'm so glad we have this conversation. And I, I hope all the other 
guys from the units like three two and, and reconnaissance can, can listen to this and say wow these guys did it long before us without any training just to add on to uh, this improvising um at at one stage um things were so hectic and busy um you know and and there wasn't always a, between me and Doc joint, although he would come and visit us every three three months. Um, uh, one day, they just arrived, three Samo truck loads full of, it uh, looked like a gunpowder. And it was a, an explosive called hexagon or something. Maybe you, you know it, but it, it it's typically like a gunpowder and we didn't have i mean uh, it's 30 tons we didn't have space for it i my explosives bunkers were full already so we just dug big holes and uh, we stuck it in there and a, a couple of trees on top and an army tent covering it and then the doc came and he, he told us, okay, this is now your new. He, he got this from somewhere, probably Mother Fontaine. And uh, we used that also very effective uh, on the railway line. It was, it was a, a low detonation, high explosive uh, detonation. So it had a very good blast effect. Uh, we we even made uh, tank obstacles or you know tank uh, what you call it, under law or um, ambushes where you you could blast a, a big ditch like uh, three four meters by ten fifteen meters and the tanks can't uh, cross that so. That, that was very effective. Can I ask you, gentlemen, a, a, a question, a last question? Because I can see this is going to be a very long episode. And I want to say to all of you as well, you know, we have these new initiatives at Legacy were fundraising. And we got somebody in charge of that who's called Anita Els. Uh, she should have been here, but thanks to ESCOM, uh, she couldn't. You know, now it is, no internet, blah, blah, blah. But I believe at some stage in the future, we're going to ask all three of these teams to, to have like a little evening somewhere where you people can come out and buy yourself a dinner. And then they can speak about explosives to you. Obviously, they'll be able to say a lot more there than what they can say online here. This is obviously, we have to draw a line somewhere. We don't want to help a terrorist. Uh, but this is fascinating, you know, if you have a historical things which, which comes along and we're going to keep you informed of, of that. Just be be warned that that's going to happen in the future. I think it will be fantastic to meet the authors and to meet these people and talk to them. But now I have a last question to the three of you. Currently, right now, as we sit here, there's a, there's a fight going on in Hamas, between Hamas in Israel in the Gaza Strip. And I've heard reports, and we will broadcast on this through our Israeli Defense Force mates. But what we've heard is that Hamas is using the shells and things which were not exploded. They're taking out the uh, explosives from these shells, and then they're using it against the Israelis. My first question is, how hard is it to do that? Because I know you can actually boil it out. If you cook that shell, you get it, the explosive turns to liquid and you just get it out and then you can use it again. Of course, it's dangerous. Then go and try this at home. If you see something which is strange looking to you, then flip and run away and, and call the police or somebody, but don't, don't, don't be stupid. Um, did this happen during the World War, Pion and Steph and, and Esfian? Did this happen during the uh, the border war as well, as, as far as you know. Dion, shall we ask you first? Um, I really don't know. Um, 
I've all I know is that they were shit scared of these explosives. They could have, and um, it includes all the or or artillery pro projectiles and so forth. If they ever used them in mines, um, blowing up uh, uh, patrols and stuff, I really don't don't know. I don't think so. There's a guy, uh, Roland Schickerling, Schickerling. He wrote an, a very interesting book on his on his um, memoirs when, during the Boer War, and he never mentioned anything ab about that using uh, artillery rounds to uh, do uh, IEDs or other explosives. All, all they used, as far as I know, was the, the, the dynamite, and the, and the sources of the time. Of the, these sticks came from Taugen's rest of the gold mines there and in Barberton. They said, and, and they um, spread that evenly between the commanders. Because in the far west, um, they, uh, Commandant uh, uh, General Liebenberg, he, they, they, they had four uh, uh, sections. The one was the southeastern line between Volkswest and, and uh, Heidelberg. The, the eastern line between Kumatipoort and Pretoria. The northern one was uh, Petersburg and Pretoria. And the southwestern line was between Joburg and Klerksdorf. Um, and in all those cases, I, they all used dy uh, uh, dynamite. And um, I don't know of any other um, booby traps or stuff that they've that, 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 that made. Well, see if I can add a, uh, once we did the resupply to Renault, Renama there in the Gorongosa Heights. And it was four C 130s that dropped pellets, each pellet about um, 100 kilograms. Ah, sorry, 1,000 kilograms. In that was landmines. Uh, and the one shoot cut off and it tilted, and all that landmines and ammunition fell from a height, uh, probably 1,000 feet, 1,000 meters, and it hit the ground. None of them went off. And I actually went and I had a look at one of the landmines. Now, landmines, what, what, 20, 15 centimeters high. It was flattened to less than half the size of that. But it didn't go off. You need, like Steve said, you need that booster or detonator with a much higher velocity to initiate uh, the explosion. So I, I'm not experienced if you can boil it out. Yes, you can. But they have such excess of how much to explosive. I mean, when they killed that uh, 20 Israeli soldiers in the building, it was already rigged with about, I, I think, 20 or 50 landmines. And they initiated that with the RPG. It, it does have the explosive and, and the velocity. Uh, but I think, yes, you can probably boil it up. I won't try it. Uh, I think that's the last option they would go for because they've, stack so many things they build up for this war for 10 years back i believe internet thank you uh, we lost uh you know steph no dear as well but he did say that the escom is gonna get him uh but i found this very interesting you know i found this fascinating you know we need to to remember our history because nobody else uh, nobody else is gonna do it guys and you know what happens when at school these days all of you who have grandkids or are still based with children at school, uh, let me tell you what they, what they are taught in history is most definitely not what is the truth and what we know for a fact has happened. And therefore, it's important that we support initiatives like this where we say, but let us draw the line all the way through. Let us see how these things developed and let us see what we've learned from history. So thank you to all of my guests. And as we say at, at Legacy, uh, God bless you all until we meet again. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications.